Okay. Sorry, everyone. That was my um, mess up. I didn't even put an intro on here. I started. I put the intro. I introduced Claire and uh, Mike, and then I realized not live, not live. And now I've got more music. Here we are. And, oh, yeah, we're my back. God. Oh my back God. to one. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> Mark is Mark is going to give me a lot of uh, grief. About no, that. he's not. He'll give it to me, and I've I've got broad shoulders. I got you covered, Mike. <laughs> just just put him back in his cage, Clara. That's all you have to do. <laughs> oh, that again. put him back in the kennel. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh. Okay, so so sorry, guys. I mean, we didn't go too far. We just sort of we're doing a quick recap and talking yeah. about rosemary and that she is watching and we all said hi rosemary and that people sent her flowers today and she was a bit overwhelmed by that and uh mike was kind of catching it uh, doing a little recap so we can start the rest of the story now yes Absolutely. and just a so reminder if you haven't watched part one please do so um Great, amazing detail there, and a lot of the lead up that will fill in the holes of what you're about to hear tonight. Absolutely. Um, again, just a brief, brief recap. Um, we had covered in part one that my mother, Rosemary Chickwalk, previously Rosemary Brown, who had worked for Scientology for 35 years, was subjected to extreme elder physical and financial abuse um, at the hands of her Scientology employers while she was an active Sea Org member. These is, this is the part of Scientology where people dedicate their lives to working for Scientology for next to nothing. During this time, uh, she lived in very substandard conditions and they were also um, harvesting her money as she would get it from social security payments in various different schemes by opening up fraudulent credit cards, uh, either for herself or others, and then making her pay them off um, to the tune of um, $160,000 plus over the course of about nine years. So all that came to a head when she uh, fell very ill during the time that she was working for them up until 2021. She um, had need of supplemental oxygen. She didn't have a walker. She, she wasn't being properly taken care of, meaning she needed the oxygen and she did not have it. Um, she was working very long hours and she ended up hospitalized at Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital. I think it was Hollywood Presbyterian. That's the one that's just down around the corner yeah, from the a, complex. A, right. That's exactly yeah, right. Across, across from the pizza place. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Across Vermont. Yeah, exactly. So just on Vermont and Fountain, I think, are the cross streets for Hollywood Presbyterian, yep. quite literally a block from their headquarters. Um, she was very dehydrated and had uh, a very bad case of pneumonia. They thought she had a stroke, but she was just unresponsive because her oxygen levels had dropped so considerably that she wasn't able to stay conscious. So she very possibly would have died if she had not been gotten to the hospital, but she it should have never gotten that bad in the first place with no medical care follow ups as a post op um, heart patient from many, many years ago. She just wasn't get, being given proper medical care. So um, when their members um, are uh, very close to death, that is usually when they will usually get a hold of extended family. Um, I was not the extended family that they wanted to get a hold of because I, <laughs> as a former member, am a declared suppressive person because I didn't want to be there. I was a second generation Scientologist brought in at a very young age uh, with my mother when she was a single mom and she got recruited into the Sea Org. I ended up leaving and went my own way. And then she was left there and I was pretty much shunned by the organization, their version of that, which is called disconnection. Um, I found out about this in February of um, 2021. Uh, I got a call from my uncle who had heard from uh, my aunt and uh, who got a phone call from, I think the medical officer uh, and said, Rosemary had a stroke. She's not doing well. She's expected to pass soon. This was right during COVID. Um, it was also where I was in the United States, a massive snowstorm. So it took me about 24 hours in order to get travel arrangements in order to make it out to LA. I was able to figure out which hospital she was in. I called, she was in the intensive care unit. I was able to call the hospital and actually get through and a nurse 
was able to put the phone up to her ear. And I was, you know, she briefly came into consciousness long enough for me to tell her I loved her and I'm on my way. I, I was thinking that would be the last time I got a chance to talk to her. Um, so I get there and she's starting to become conscious. Um, again, during COVID visiting hours in hospitals for anyone that had to deal with that, they know what I'm talking about. They're very narrow windows. There's only one person allowed in at a time. Everyone's masked up being tested. It's, it's a, it's a routine in order to get in and out of those, um, areas and for good reason at the time. Um, but it made visiting hours extremely short. So there was one in the morning and one in the afternoon, I stayed out there for about five days and was able to kind of sit at her bedside. And, uh, during this time, she was slowly starting to come back into consciousness and the cardiologist that was, uh, on service there came in and we were talking, they were doing a bunch of testing, trying to figure out like, what kind of stroke did she have? And they're like, she didn't have a stroke. She just has pneumonia. So they put her on oxygen. She started getting, you know, the IV antibiotics. She was first, um, getting, uh, IV, a lot of fluids. And, uh, once she started coming around, they got her to start eating, um, just resting a lot. And she started to improve. So her condition got so bad because of the way she was living. And then when she was then given care, she started, she didn't die. She actually started slowly recovering, but the recovery was long. Um, during this time, again, I am still declared a suppressive person. She's a, she's very happy to see me, but she's also not sure what sort of trouble it's going to be for the organization that I'm showing up there. So the medical liaison officer, um, this is the person that's just in charge of bringing people to and from doctor's appointments. This is not a, a doctor or a nurse or a healthcare professional. This is just a person that is keeping track of the amount of sick people and can't keep up with them probably. So, um, had come in one day and just given her the, uh, a briefing from the, uh, senior counselor in Scientology called a, uh, a case supervisor that she was authorized. They were authorizing her to die. So that you are, they say it, you are authorized to drop your body, which is a very impersonal way to say you as a spiritual being can like go find another body. Um, they, they really do believe that. And sitting there through her saying that was very strange. Like I have, I don't, you know, retain any of the belief system of Scientology at all, but seeing this happen and seeing a person both say these things and then her receive it, she, she didn't really know what to say, but was almost like acknowledging like any other Scientologist or CR member would do if they're given an order. She just said, okay. And I'm like, anyway, mind boggling. She was too stubborn to die, which Hooray, thank you. Rosemary. <laughs> it brings me to tears every single time. I, I, when right. you, when you talk about that, you know, in her state of unconsciousness, what, what she felt in relation to you every single yeah. time I, I can't make it through. <laughs> We've always had a very close connection. Um, probably when I was young, I was very much a mama's boy and she, you know, I will, I will, say with, you know, not, not trying to badmouth anybody, but I would say that parents in the C organization, Mike, my mom, uh, the, my friend's parents, no matter whatever their parent, uh, their parental or maternal instincts were Scientology and the C org, the requirements for how we worked and how we lived, you were uniformly horrible parents. And it was just the way that it was, you know, even my mom, who was very loving, she was not available. Um, and things now that I have kids and able to reflect back on that, it just, yeah. it blows my mind. And I know you've done some videos about this and spot on, like my kids now, when I was in their shoes at that age, I'm like, oh my goodness. So anyway, I know, we're, we're I always very about, close. I, I think <laughs> about, oh, you know, well, what if, uh, uh, Shane had gone and joined the Sea Org and got married already? <clears throat> like, right. Oh yeah. Right. It, it, well, how old is he? 16. Yeah, my oldest oh, yeah. right now is that it, <laughs> I had I was already at the headquarters, already married to Mark, had already been in the C organization for two years. Yeah, and you know Benjamin <laughs> right. and, and he's a Benjamin senior in high Taryn school. <laughs> were on post by the time that they were eleven or twelve, the same age as mm -hmm. Jack, like on post. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, I mean I got married in the C org. I was eighteen, and my ex wife Samantha, she was sixteen. Yeah. I mean, and that was, that was pretty normal, uh, for the way that things were anyway. 
Rosemary and all kind of getting back to it. Rosemary and I have always been extremely close. Um, and that was one of the things when she was on the rehabilitation project force, they were trying to program out of her is she was constantly in grief about having to disconnect from me. And she's supposed to get over that grief. Right. And, uh, this was the frame of mind that they, she's been programmed in for all of, all of these years and this, and I'm taking a little bit of time to elaborate on this because it's important to understand what it takes to get somebody out of Scientology that's been in it for a very long time because of the way their mindset is set up. So when she was on the rehabilitation project force and going through grief, I don't know what process they were doing, but they're having her come up with things that would be uh, equally bad as not being in contact with me. So and Claire, you can probably say, oh, that's this kind of process or whatever. It's trying to just get the person to disassociate from their current grief and, you know, kind of finding a surrogate for it, or I don't know what it does. Yeah. It's counseling but, on, on losses, but yeah, it's like, find something that's not upsetting to you. Find something that doesn't remind you of Mike, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And obviously so it was a it lot of that anyway. So yeah. Blah, yeah. Blah. But the, <laughs> But the conclusion she came up to, and this is the mindset of a Sea Org member, the equal thing in her mind to not being able to be in contact with me, with me was if COB David Miscavige somehow died. She, what a loss that would be. So that is a maternal instinct that's being like associated with the loss of their leader. And that was she, then that was an equal thing in her mind when they were putting her through this process. That's where she kind of arrived at. So that's just the level of indoctrination that they're putting their people through. And they, they're very compliant after you deal with years and years and years of this. And there's no connection to the outside world. You don't have cell phones. You don't have TV. There, you're not, your mail is all checked and open. So any of these influences that would probably pull you away from the organization are tamped down or just not allowed at all. So anyway, back to her story where we're at. So she spends about 45 days in Hollywood Presbyterian as an inpatient. She was between uh, the ICU floor and a rehab floor, just getting her to the point where she could get out of bed on her own, be able to, you know, go to the bathroom, move around. They got her a walker, like, you know, just kind of weaning her back on the amount of oxygen she needed treating um, the pneumonia. Uh, and then at a certain point, she was, st her prognosis was not necessarily clear by this time. I've already, I've had to leave. And, you know, for me thinking like, did I want to leave? I did not want to leave, but, um, everyone's got to understand. I did not have any legal, um, right to my mother. And that sounds strange, but the medical liaison officers in these organizations actually have signed powers of attorneys and medical power of attorney to be able to act on these people's behalf. So if a family member shows up, the organization, are, they have legal documentation that say, hey, we're the caretaker for this person. You know, then if they're sitting there being watched, you know, aka probably the stuff that Bob Ferris is dealing with, this organization has kind of almost legal representation rights to this, to these elderly people. Mm -hmm. um, so even if I wanted to get her out, I mean, we're geographically separated from where I live and where she lives, but she was still in the hospital. So I wasn't able to maintain communication with her because she was being controlled by the medical team. And I also didn't have the legal, um, any legal, um, weight to be able to do anything for this. So it was still kind of an impossible situation. So 45 days go by and she has moved into a hospice facility. Um, it sounds more glamorous than it was, but what this place is, is it was a facility in Glendale. Um, it, it is referred to as a board and care facility. And what this would look like um, would be just a normal house that is owned by somebody and all of the rooms and the bedrooms and the, the kitchen and um, all of that is just set up for old people to be put in similar to a nursing home, but it doesn't have nursing staff. It's they, they're kind of living there and their caretakers are not medically trained. They're just there to make their meals, help them get in and out of bed. And if they need medical care, medical care has to be called. So this was um, a, a kind of a sketchy place. It was owned by this Armenian guy that would do like UFC wrestling stuff on the side, going back and forth from Vegas. And he owned these board and care facilities in Glendale. And then Scientology, the Sea Org is taking their, 
very sick people and putting them in these facilities when they can't keep them closer to the pack base. And, and the reason for that is they don't want anybody dying on the property. Right. They don't want Correct. anybody to pass away in a Scientology facility because mm -hmm. that might bring bad PR or people coming into the building and seeing what's really going on there. Paramedics showing up and walking into a room with a dozen elderly women in right. bunk mm -hmm. beds, obviously poorly cared for. You just can't have that. And it terrifies Scientology that that might happen. So they shuffle them off to the cheapest available place where they can be. And um, that's exactly where Rosemary ended up in yeah. the cheapest available off-site premises that they could get her into. Right. Correct. Now, as bad as that sounds, the living conditions were significantly better than living at the pack base. So Understood. at this point, yeah, like she's being fed three square meals. She doesn't have to walk all over the place. She at least has her own bed. Um, she has a window. She she would she had those windows she could look out. And uh, even though there's a bunch of like trash and stuff being kept out in the back, there was a fruit tree. Like when you're in the concrete jungle of Los Angeles, most of the time, these old people, they go to and from their from their living quarters that in the Sea Org they refer to as birthing, like because they're they're doing this, you know, pretend Navy stuff. They walk through the tunnel system over to their office space. They might not go outside and get in fresh air for months. Like right. it, like they just keep them inside. So there was a, there was some like, like basic landscaping around this place for her. This was more green than she had seen in decades. And there was a, uh, an orange tree in the backyard. Like this, this was like Disneyland for somebody that was stuck in the situation she was in. So she slowly starts to recover. And one day I get an email. This is um, probably in July. I, I, I still don't have any way of contacting, of being in contact with her. I keep asking her, um, my, my aunts and uncles, if they've heard anything, nobody's heard anything. All of a sudden I get an email from my, um, from my aunt that says, Hey, your mother's trying to send you an email. And I'm thinking like, they don't have emails. Like that, that isn't a thing. So it's probably, you know, Osa trying to harass me and whatever. So I, I was very skeptical about it. But she, it was actually Rosemary, and she was in this board and care facility. When she was originally there, she didn't know what to do with her time. Like she would just sit in the room by herself all day, just staring at the walls. Like they were, and the the caretaker would come in and say, "Do you want to watch TV?" She was terrified to watch TV. They're like, "We can put on westerns, like or whatever." And she she didn't know what to think about, like what to do with like like this. What do I do with my hands? Like she had no idea what to do with and not being constantly engaged in work. Like you're either working or going to the next thing or being kept track of. And that's what she had done for 35 years. She didn't know what to do with idle time. So she um, was starting, she would keep calling the medical officers. Like, I, I, well, I want to come back to the pack base. I mean, I miss all my friends. I'm, I feel like alone here. I, you know, the only people here have either dementia or uh, Parkinson's like no one will, I don't have anyone to talk to. So the barbell light, um, had come out and, uh, her late husband, David light had a Kindle for whatever reason. So she wanted to kind of shut Rosemary up. So she's like, Hey, I put the Scientology network app on here. Here's a Kindle. Like you can like look at books and stuff on here. Apparently no one read Ron Miscavige's book where he like mm -hmm. got a Kindle and like learned the truth about the world. <laughs> right. But this is, this JB, is a, listen, like a, a JB. <laughs> yeah. And listen to my husband, Mark on coast to coast through the Kindle right. and all of those things. Yeah. So no, that was the old school Kindle. <laughs> that was like the old school Kindle with like the, you know, the liquid ink. Like it's yes. like, oh, it looks like paper. No, yes. the Kindle she had was a tablet. Like it was a Samsung okay. tablet that just was from Amazon. Nice. So it was like a computer. So she's like messing around on here and like, you know, playing around, touching the buttons. And she realizes like, hey, I can like, like do stuff. So she sets up an email account for herself. She's extremely resourceful, taught herself how to use the Internet, more or less. And um, and then she also had gotten a cell phone because she had to do like now she, that she was in this facility, she had to constantly check in with a cardiologist that she had been assigned and insurance was paying for that. So she had a cell phone and she had this little tablet. So she's starting to get on the internet, of course, looking at all the great stuff Scientology is doing and not really finding that. But she starts emailing me. 
Um, and so and th this is just some advice. And I know Mark has gone over this. I think Aaron has gone over this a bit too. And, and so have both of you about the way to talk to somebody if they are in a cult in order to help them, which is not in any way to try to blame them or to put them in a situation where they are wrong for all of their life's decisions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she started reaching out to me and all I did was say, Hey mom, it's great to hear you. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing better. I'm able to get up and walk around. I have a walker. I'm, you know, Oh, that's really great. And so we were just kind of corresponding back and forth. And then I asked her, so do you want to call? And she's like, I don't, I don't know if I should. And I'm like, okay, well, if you want to. So then she called me and we started talking and I, I at no time tried to tell her like, she was wrong, had to get her out of there. I didn't really understand her medical condition. Again, I, I think that she's very close to probably dying still. So over the course of the next several months, we are slowly starting to talk again, making it very safe for her to communicate with me and not getting into any blaming uh, about her situation. And I do realize that the, the, the timeline that I had available to me and the fact that she was separated from this group that was constantly reindoctrinating her is why this worked this way. Yeah. Um, I was, I was start, I was able to start asking her questions like, Hey, you know, we had, you know, found out, you know, back many years ago that they had started taking money from you. Can, is any of that? So I just kind of was asking things and she started kind of telling me stories. This is the other thing about CRG members. You're so conditioned to be security checked all the time. If you ask one of them any question, they will answer exactly what you're like. You ask the question. There is no, there's no such thing as a, uh, and I'm not going to answer filter like for the right. CRG members. I know that there's <laughs> TRs that teach people to lie, but for the average CRG members, they, they, they're the, they, they couldn't stand an interrogation if it, their life depended on it. They just sit there and talk and talk and talk and talk. So we started talking and she started expressing what was going on and, you know, some, um, things that she was upset about with the organization. And I mentioned to her, I'm like, well, do you remember Mike Rinder? And she's like, yeah, I remember Mike. And, you know, she, we talked about that a little bit. And I said, well, Mike's doing this thing called a podcast. And I had to explain what a podcast was and how it worked, but I was able to walk her through being able to go on Amazon, go on and find the, um, the podcasts of the fair game podcasts. And with that, there were a lot of interviews with people that she knew extremely well, like Jeff Hawkins and like people that she had a lot of history with. And I'm like, Hey, go ahead and just listen to these. If, if they don't make you feel good, don't listen to them anymore. So I had sent her some headphones because what she would be doing is she would start listening to these. And she knew there were other people around. There were still Scientologists, even though they had dementia and every once in a while, the MLOs would come through. So she would be holding it up like really close so that no one else could hear what she was doing. So I got her some headphones because that's ridiculous. So she would just be in there all day long, sitting in her bed. Everyone thought she was listening to music and she's like just gobbling up all of the podcasts that Mike and Leah had been doing for all of the years, like from the beginning all the way through to the end. Then she watched all of these um, Scientology and the Aftermath documentaries all the way through to the end. And then once she had done that, I'm like, hey, there's a documentary I would very much like for you to watch, which was going clear. Scientology in the prison of belief. She's like, and I'm like, you, if you want to watch it, if you don't, that's totally fine. And she, she watched it. And up till that point, all of the stories were very topical that had to do with specific instances of something specific happening to that person. But what that documentary did is it laid out an overview of kind of Scientology in general, and then the fraud that is connected with that and her watching that documentary was enough for it to click in her head that it's not just me waiting for hubbard to come back and for it to get better that she ad immediately like a light switch went off and she's like i'm i need to get out of here like i don't want to be here anymore and it was that stark of a change but this was over a several week period where she was able to approach this information on her own which I very much think that's probably what a lot of under the radar people are doing by watching these okay. um, videos on YouTube. Yeah. And she was able to slowly deprogram herself to the point of like, Hey, can I think critically about something or am I just going to do what I'm told? So at this point, it's a really weird situation because now she wants out of there, but she can't say that to anybody like um, because of how connected she was 
both when she was at the Int base working for the executives there on the VIP lines. And then because of us now starting to slowly f- find out about these financial crimes, I was convinced that if anyone got word of her wanting to leave, they would have whisked her away and I would have never been able to figure out where she was again. Yeah. I re- and I remember you telling me that at the time yep. too. So this is around the time I was talking to you two, like, what do I do? Yeah. Um, and then I started looking at like, okay, well, what does it take? What it, as I'd never looked at this before. What is, how do you get an elderly person into a care facility? What's the price tag on that? I'm here to tell you it is significant. So whatever your mortgage is, double that. And that's the monthly cost for senior care. It is out of control. And again, this, what normal people do is that their life's work, they accumulate wealth, they have investments, social security being a very, probably a small portion of that, whatever they're able to then liquidate in order to pay for their retirement years. That's the normal thing in society that people do. Sierra so members don't have anything and all the money that she did have was taken from her. So what to do? Um, So talking to Mike, talking to Claire, I'm like, hey, I'm trying to figure out what to do with this. And the two of you, like, you were so nonchalant about it. Like, hey, we're here to help. And the Aftermath Foundation can absolutely help your mom. And I'm just thinking, like, I'm just doing the math in my head about how much this is going to cost. And I'm just like, okay, I got to find another solution. There's no way. Like, I was convinced that it would be uh, such a drain on the movement that it would, like, make a, a, a significant problem. So I was looking for other other solutions going back and forth. But the other problem that I had is still, I didn't have any legal uh, paperwork to be able to help her. All of the, They still have powers of attorney for all of her stuff. So I had to figure out what to do with that. I also needed to be able to talk to her doctors that are in communication with the medical officers from Scientology in such a way that they do not tell Scientology that her son is talking to them. Mm-hmm. So this is where I started. To, so I knew you guys were there and available, but there was a lot of details that we had to work out before this. So I reached out to a couple of friends. There were two, two friends um, out in California that would, had been there for me the entire time to work through this. One of them is Justin Tompkins, formerly known as Justin Miscavige. Uh, the other one is Roan Horwich, um, who is L. Ron Hubbard's granddaughter. Both of them were also former Int Base Sea Org members, and we all grew up together and we're all like, we're all best friends and we'd still stayed in contact with one another. So I was able to draft up powers of attorney and all of the paperwork, both legal and medical, that I needed to be able to get in front of my mom for her to sign. And then we needed to get it notarized so that any current paperwork we had was able to, in, by the date that it was signed, override anything that Scientology might have. But how to get that out there? Like if I send it in the mail, like it's probably going to get intercepted. So what I did, I sent all the documents to Roanne who printed them off. She went into this facility. She pretended that she was my cousin, Allison, because you have to sign in at the front. And, and you know, it's during COVID. Everyone's wearing a mask anyway. She could have been <laughs> Allison. No one would ever know. Right. Went in there, <clears throat> got Rosemary, went and got these things signed. We had a notary come to her because the because this is kind of a board and care facility owned by this Armenian guy, it wasn't tightly controlled by their security. So we were able to get things in and out a little bit. So it was, we we're able to smuggle stuff uh, and make that happen. Um, got this stuff done, got it all sent back to me. And now I had the paperwork. So with that, I was able to then send that to her medical doctors to let them know, Hey, I'm updating powers of attorney. These are the most current. You are only to talk to me. You're not to talk to anybody else. We set up some calls because the next question is, how do I move a little old woman that needs to be on oxygen and is barely able to move in a walker across the country? Um, I needed very much to be able to like, I need, I need to know if she can, if she can't leave, then I'm going to have to find care for her in California, but I don't live in California. So ideally I need to get her to close to where I live out on the East coast. So how is this going to work? So we finally got a meeting with a cardiologist. We went over all of her. Uh, she had had a bunch of testing done. He said, she is okay to travel. She, as long as she has supplemental oxygen and then she needs to minimize her walking. So she's going to need to move around in a wheelchair. I'm like, okay, great. So now we know we can move her. So at this point we have the green light medically. Now I need to find a care facility out here that is able to take her in. 
again, trying to do these things without the person physically available to sign paperwork. And when you're putting them into a legitimate care facility, they're like, Hey, so we need this paperwork signed. You're like, okay, so let's, let's get it. I'm going to, you know, we'll send it out there. We'll get it signed. We'll get some stuff back. We'll get it all set up. And then you set up a date for when the person's usually going to like, Hey, we got a room. We're going to get you in a lot of logistics involved. The other logistics is now we're going to, we're going to fly somebody that needs to be on oxygen. And, uh, usually people see like the little oxygen cart, you're carrying around a little bottle following you around. You can't take that on an airplane. It's like carrying a bomb on an airplane, like right. a big you know, pressurized thing of oxygen. Like the like TSA is like, that's not going to work. So now you need one of these little mini oxygen generators. Those aren't covered by insurance. Those are several thousand dollars to get. So we had to get her one of those. Again, I'm like, okay, Claire, I'm, I'm like doing up a, you know, a spreadsheet and a budget on all these uh, things. And I'm like, okay, let's, you know, hopefully some of this stuff will be able to be covered. I, you know, give all the, get the quotes and everything to Claire and she's like, okay, so when are we booking the flights? And I'm like, so we're able to do this and be like, yeah, no problem. And I'm like, let me be clear. Like when we get her into this facility, I like, you could look up because I'm active duty military, you could look up online for what a chief warrant officer for makes. And everyone knows what my income level is. I can tell you, I can't, um, afford senior healthcare, like while I'm raising three little girls, you know, it's like, that would be a drain on my wife and I, to the point of like, we would, it would be devastating. So the aftermath foundation said, look, we are here to help people that are trying to set up their lives after Scientology, whatever that is, you, we will, we'll present it to the board. We will discuss it and we will decide if it's something that we can do. So I was sitting here worried about, is this going to be too much? And you all made it very clear to me that that was your problem to solve. And if it was too much, you would let me know. And at no time was I ever told that it was too much. Yeah. So we did the application for aid through the foundation, uh, which everyone, like we heard back within the week. And then you're like, okay, you're approved. So let's get this to all to happen. And it was now the, from the time she was in this board and care facility, she was, we had her, um, getting physical therapy. She's able to now walk around. She's now much more ambulatory and she was probably good to travel. So we scheduled all this, um, in March of 2022 for me to fly out to California. Uh, I had her measure every single thing in her room, which she didn't have much stuff. So I knew exactly the size of every single thing. And I just set up a trunk with suitcases and stuff in it. It was like one of these Russian nesting dolls. I open it up and all the suitcases pop out and we could hopefully pack everything into it. Um, the team that we got together for this was myself, Justin and Roan, And we also had Rachel Hastings, um, who Mike and Leah have recently done an interview with, and she started to speak out, who was there in order to document this happening. We weren't trying to make this a spectacle, but we wanted to document this because we were actually like, it felt like, you know, going in past enemy lines in order to recover somebody. It was significant. And we also wanted a person there in the event that Scientology got stupid and figured out like this, what's happening. And then they start showing up with security. Right. So we worked out all of the routes when we were going to have to be at the airport, when we were going to have to start it, how long the drive was from the complex to Glendale in case somebody was alerted. We had talked to the FBI. So the FBI was tracking on all this in the event that something got stupid, we could call them. And we just set this up that we had exact timelines for when exact things had to happen. Um, it actually worked out well because we hit rush hour. And then if anyone was trying to move around in and amongst us getting her, they wouldn't be able to drive. So we were able to get, um, so we went, we met at eight o'clock in the morning at the end of March, um, outside of this facility. Um, myself, Justin, Roan were in one vehicle and Rachel was in another vehicle. We got everything ready. And the, the day prior to this, I was, you know, I, I had been now calling, um, my mom and letting her know, Hey, this is what we're doing. And every day that we would talk, I would, there's a little thing we do in the military when you're on a deployment it's the number of days you have left until you get home and then a wake up. So I'd be like, Hey mom, 10 days and a wake up. And she thought that was so fun. So then when it was finally just the night before, um, it was a lot. And for me, like I was, I was driving past the place, like scoping everything out, like burning, you know, California gas. They're not giving that stuff away. I'm like, this stuff's like $4 more expensive than everywhere else in the country. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so true. scoped it all out. We showed up that morning. Um, we knocked at the door. 
hi, you know, family coming in, you know, say hi. The, the caregiver, again, you just start this Armenian lady. She's real nice, um, but barely speaks English. Went inside. We went in, closed the door, and um, I had not seen her since she was in the hospital almost unconscious. And she was in there, and when we came in, she knew why we were there because this was very much her desire to get out of there. And um, the emotions connected with this were a lot. Like she was like, it was like the happy crying, you know, she was physically shaking because she was so excited. You can just imagine the adrenaline and like, yeah. she's got a heart condition. So I'm like, mom, I need you to sit down, put your oxygen on. Um, <laughs> so, so it's this weird mix of like, we're trying to hurry and get her out of there. But at the same time, it's like, we're reuniting for the first time. And it's like, we can get you out of here. And she wants to leave. So it was very, very rushed. So uh, Roanne was outside. Um, she had her truck running. Just and I, we, you know, it kind of like, I told him like, okay, here's all the stuff that she has. And this is where it's going to go in the trunks. We're like stuffing stuff into the suitcases. And the last thing that I needed before we can leave was her medication. Hmm. So once we had everything ready, I like, you know, poke my head out and say, Hey, you know, whatever. I can't remember what the lady's name was. So she came in. I said, Hey, I'm her son. Um, we're, we're moving her to another facility and I need her medication, please. And the lady was like, uh, okay. And she went and got it for me and brought it in. I'm like, thanks. And we went out, we got her directly, um, into the vehicle. Mike and Mike split hold on. Yeah. I think we got a photo. This okay, this is, is you and Rosemary walking out the front door. Yes, this is us leaving this board and care facility. Um, you know, and I have, you know, her purse in my hand and she's got her walker and we're getting her, you know, straight out the front. And um, then we go straight into uh, the truck. I had her oxygen machine set up in there. So you can see she's not wearing her oxygen but I had the oxygen machine plugged in in the truck, like ready to go. So as soon as we got her in there, I could then have her on oxygen and it has a battery pack and everything. Um, and then if we go to the next photo, this is us as we're driving down the road. And this, you know, I took this photo. I, I sent this photo to Mike, to Leah and to Claire. And I said, yes. we're out. We're on our way to the airport. And then we called Mike and we're like, you know, and then you got on the phone and she's like, Mr. Render, is that you? And he's like, you can call me Mike now. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly what she said. Mr. Render, yeah. is that you? <laughs> yeah. And, she, so and, she was just elated. Just, at this yeah. Point. Just to reiterate the poetic justice of it. This was with the help of Justin Tompkins, Miscavige, and Roanne, Elron Hubbard's granddaughter. Just amazing. Well, how yeah. So. That? Oh. Wait, how do I get you guys back? Hey, oh, 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 there we go. I feel like we're on Aaron's channel and he's moving us around all the time. He's the master of moving all these things. But anyway, well, I'm um, the master I have of to... moving them, but I don't do it deliberately. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just from my view, I want to because my close personal friends were there unconditionally in order to help somebody in order to get out and just to give a shout out to them and then also because, you know, Justin, he's not a public face um, on speaking out, mainly because he has other professional um, interests that he doesn't really want that to uh, get in the way of. Um, Roanne also hasn't been a person to publicly speak out, but I think it's important for everyone to understand that the, the choice to make yourself a public feature, kind of like I'm doing now, is a very, it's a very hard choice to make. And it's not necessarily right for everybody. Yep. I would say the vast majority of people that leave, especially if they're second or third generation Scientologists, have a lot of trauma that they're dealing with. And the decision for what they do with their life going forward, and if it makes sense for them, is a very personal decision. And for me, this feels therapeutic. For, I'm guessing for Claire, for Mike, this feels therapeutic. But for other people, it might just drag them back into something that you're, that you're trying to recover from. So yeah. when, when push came to shove, my friends were there and they were there for Rosemary when it absolutely mattered. And, uh, and, you know, 
just because you might not see somebody publicly doing something, it doesn't mean that they're not doing a whole lot on the, on the side as well. So I think yep. that's just worth mentioning just because if it wasn't for that help, like I couldn't have done it by myself, like without the people that were there without Rachel, without Justin, without Roanne, I would have been like with a rental car. And now I'm trying to go back through Avis and return a rental car and get her like on the shuttle to go to the airport. Like it was, this was, couldn't have gone smoother. It was literally like clockwork. So yeah. we get her out and we go straight to the airport and the foundation, you know, is, as was like, I'm, I'm trying to like select flights and Claire and I are going over this. Hey, you know, this is the flight that I need to take so we can get her back at this time so that it's during her normal hours and I'm not disrupting her schedule. And Claire's like, why are you selecting those seats? And I'm like, well, these are the seats that I'm going to select. She's like, you need to put her in first class because she's right by the door. She needs to be comfortable and she doesn't need to walk all the way through that airplane. And I mean, I'm a big oaf. Like, I'm like, I don't even know how to spell first class. I'm like, okay. So you know, you're like, no, this is happening. So I'm like, well, I'm getting in trouble if this doesn't happen. So, um, so we got to the airport, we got through security. Uh, we got her a porter to move us around. Um, and I took her because we had about an hour before the flight. Um, I took her to, we were flying American airlines. So I took her to the admiral's lounge, which is for all the first class, you know, it's the big business executives can go in there and then, you know, have a, have lunch and, you know, have a drink or whatever they're going to do before their flight comes. So now I'm taking her out of this situation into first class luxury, you know, while we're waiting for the flight. And then just as it's time to board, the person comes and grabs us and walks us right to the gate. We get straight on the airplane. And, um, the second we got on the airplane, a bit of a sigh of relief happened once the doors were closed and no one was the wiser. It was like, okay, we're good. Um, one thing that was interesting and it's worth mentioning just with regard to this care facility she was in, these places, you are not a, in. they are not inpatient, meaning everyone is free to come and go as they want to. So when we were leaving, Rosemary sent a text to the owner of this place, a guy named Romick, um, who owns a couple of these things on the same road and, you know, just has Scientology pushing people into him. And he's, you know, carving out money every single month as they have these people off base um, in his uh, houses. Um, she sends him a text and says, Romick, I want to thank you very much for all the care you gave me. Um, I'm leaving uh, to fly home to be closer to family. And uh, I just wanted to let you know, uh, thank you and um, have a nice day. And he writes back this super aggressive text. I don't know who is taking Rosemary, but if you don't return her right now, I'm calling the police. Dude, like, I'm so who did he call? It wasn't Ghostbusters. It was actually the MLOs. Um, uh, but it was so, so of far course, behind. He didn't we even do what were. he said he was going to do. He didn't call the police. <laughs> no, he called Scientology, just like any Scientologist yeah. does. Because I mean, I'm not saying where he's a Scientologist. Money comes from. That's right. Yeah. So she had this cell phone that was given to her by the MLOs. So um, as soon as we got that text, I immediately called the our contact at the FBI and said, hey, this is the text we got. She said, don't don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. Uh, take the battery and the SIM card out of her phone. And I was just like, <laughs> OK. <laughs> so I did. And we never turned it back on. I got her a jitterbug and she loves it. Um, and she's, you know, got a little smartphone that is perfect for her. Um, but we going back to the plane, uh, the flight was um, it was a straight through flight from uh, LAX straight to Philadelphia, which is a long flight for her. Um, so we had her and her oxygen machine. Um, she was able to wear that the entire time. They fed us a meal, which I think Mike has a picture of that. So this is us in first class. It's amazing. Um, this is very possibly the nicest meal she has ever eaten. And it's airplane food. It's first class airplane food, which, but still it was, um, they not only uh, fed us the meal, but then afterwards they're like, would you like ice cream? And she was like, ice cream. Ice so cream. you get the little thing of haagen that can, it comes with like the little stick in the lid. And anyway, that was amazing. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Um, oh, dear. Uh, so amazing. yeah, that was... That was a, a fun flight. And then on the other side, uh, we got through, we had, you know, a porter uh, waiting to help us um, to get her down to uh, the baggage claim area. My wife, Emily, was waiting for us when we got there. And uh, we 
you know, I, I took her right to the car, put her inside, came back into baggage claim, got all her stuff. We were in the vehicle and gone out of there like instantly again. And where we then drove to is a significant drive away from Philadelphia. So we, we did it in such a way that it'd be very hard for them to track her. Um, eventually they figured out where she was, but we made it, oh, we made it a clean break so that they would leave her alone. Um, yeah. and we, uh, she came home, stayed with, uh, in our house that night, we had had, uh, the new oxygen generator machine delivered to my house. It was there waiting for her, um, for her to sleep with the next day we got her then brought to her new home, which is, uh, where she lives now. She has her, uh, her own private room with her own bathroom. Um, a, a, some of these places have like rooms that you'll share with somebody else. She had already been doing that for the last 35 years. And she's like, of course she was like, yeah, I'll do whatever. And I'm like, mom, so tell me how you feel about it. She's like, I, I want to be alone for once in my life. Like I haven't had a, a alone thought. I haven't been alone with my thoughts, even in the bathroom for decades. She's like, I, I don't, I don't want to do that. And I'm like, okay, you're going to get your own room. So we, uh, got her settled in. Uh, this place is excellent. They take uh, wonderful care of her. Um, there's a lot of life enrichment opportunities for her now. Um, she's able to write poetry. She's an excellent poet. She's an excellent artist. She starts like she started doodling and some of her art is just unbelievably good. Um, like she now draws pictures of my kids. She'll get a picture of the the kids and she'll just start drawing it. And it's like, I can't draw at all. She is very, very talented. And she told me, well, when I was a little girl, I used to draw and then I just stopped. So now she's able to just do what she likes to do. She, she loves to watch people puzzler. She loves cash cab. Um, she loves to watch the YouTube stuff, but the trick is you got to do that early in the day, not right before bedtime or else it's, you know, you, you don't have want to have those crazy Dave dreams all night long, right? which yeah. we all know what those are like. And yeah. so, so Mike, I have a question for you. So at this mm -hmm. point, uh, so she's arrived at the care facility. Had she met your daughters by this point? She had seen my children once and it's when, um, my grandmother, her mother passed away. So she was able to go to the funeral and we saw her there briefly. Again, not a whole lot was said. And, and she saw the kids like, um, my youngest, I have twin girls. She was able to see them. They were, they were little babies. And then my oldest was, you know, maybe I think three or four years old. And so she hadn't seen them in a very, very long time. So now they're little girls and they barely remember, like the, the twins don't, didn't remember her at all. And then my oldest just remembered like, because there was like a family dinner where everyone was there and she kind of remembered her, but not really. So for her to reunite with her grandchildren was unbelievable. Um, like she, her maternal instinct, like I've mentioned, it was very, very strong. And though Scientology doesn't allow time for that, she always was trying the very most that she could. And I would see that a whole lot more than in some of the other kids from the ranch that mm -hmm. uh, some of their parents were on manufacturing lines or whatever. They they would like never even hear, hear from their parents. Um, when like, for instance, um, Justin Sterling, Jenna, uh, Benjamin and Taryn, they had the luxury of seeing like Mike and Ronnie and Biddy uh, and Kathy on the weekends, but you guys were also executives and your assistants would usually bring the kids to where your, your house was. There would be some kids, um, when we were at the ranch that their parents just wouldn't see them like a, often. Um, yeah. but Rosemary would always try very, uh, very much in the position she was in when she was, a. Um, on the service lines made it so she could see me quite a bit. So that was a, a bit of an advantage, but for her to reunite with her grandchildren after she's been deprived of this familial connection with so for so long, it was, uh, again, that happy cry shaking, like for everyone to get back together was very beautiful. Um, yes. Amazing. Absolutely. Amazing. I'm, I'm at a point in my life with my job and everything. I'm able to compartmentalize emotion fairly accurately for myself, I'm but, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a big crier, but if I get going, I won't stop. Um, but this, and this sorry, has been I wasn't, I wasn't trying to, to, to go there. I just, you know, it's, no, it's, just okay. such, it's such a beautiful part of the story. It's just amazing. It is. Um, so I don't want to leave everything on a high note. I want to drag it down if we can for just a yeah. minute. 
Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> no, this we this this was all a very good news story. Once we got her out, was the first time that I could start sitting down with her and actually finding out the specifics of what was happening with her finances, and that is everything that I that I laid out in detail on the last uh, recording that we did about all of the money that was taken from her. <clears throat> Up until this point, like I didn't have copies of her financials. Um, she just kind of had her ledger that she would keep track of, but she didn't have access to, you know, printers and she didn't have her, you know, a good system of files to really be able to document all these things that had occurred. She would like pay down a credit card and cancel it. And then that paperwork didn't necessarily exist anymore. So as she was explaining these things to me, I thought that I'd be getting to the bottom of it. And then it would go deeper and then deeper and then deeper. And so what we did is we just made a list of all of the different credit cards that she had ever had opened in her name. And most of that was by me going and we got copies of all of her bank statements um, back for the as far back as we could get them. And then we just went line by line on what the transactions were because they would show to which credit cards they were being paid or which check numbers were being written. And then her, the, her ledger would be like, Oh, that one's to Mickey Estrada. This one's to Sue Jan justice. This one's for, you know, payment onto this credit card. And I just, we just verified everything line by line by line by line and tried to figure out everything of what had happened. And that took many, many months. So probably around, uh, June, July timeframe, I reached back out to, uh, the foundation and I said, Hey, I'm finding out a lot of stuff that like, I can't just, we're, we're having trouble ignoring. Like when I started adding these things up, the, the number just kept increasing. I'm like, I need to get her legal representation. And I, we also probably need to talk to the authorities again. So we had all this information that we were starting to document and we then reached out and we were able to, um, get a hold of a law firm. And uh, that's when we got in contact with uh, Brad Edwards and Brittany Henderson. Brad and Brittany are like superstar attorneys. Um, they, if anyone does any research on them, they'll see that Brad and Brittany represented the victims uh, of Jeffrey Epstein. And Brad was the attorney and Brittany was his co-counsel that was just doggedly going after this guy in order to like, figure out what's going on. So they, they, um, started representing Rosemary and again, helping us try to figure out everything that's happening. And it was all very, very confusing. So, um, it took quite a long time in order to do that. And at the same time, um, mom is continuing to decompress. And also like, it wasn't like she was completely, you know, um, deprogrammed. And I know in Scientology, that's like, oh, the deprogrammers, they're going to tell you about the bad, you know, OT materials. No, deprogramming is literally like, hey, you know, can you tell us what you're like, what happened to you? Like, you know, and then helping the person understand, like, you didn't do anything wrong. You, this wasn't you that were bad. You were victimized in this. And they're like, no, 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 that's, that's, that's can't be what it was. And it's like, you, money was stolen from you. You were being treated wrong. And for a person to understand that, not to put them in a victim mentality, but to help them understand like, Hey, this isn't your fault right. is the right. main thing. And that there's, that comes off in lots of layers. Um, so through doing this, um, we, uh, she, she decided she wanted to do two things. One, we were able to identify all of the monies that were taken from her. And then at the same time, we also, she also wanted to make a clean break from the organization. And this is where it gets kind of fuzzy for us because she left, but we didn't take her from the pack base. And I know that this guy Romick had told the medical officers that she was gone, but it wasn't clear who she went with. And was she with her family in Ohio or was she with her SP son? Um, like the medical officers tried to call, Hey, just returning your call. Hope you're okay. Like fishing around. And there was some OSA emails trying to just find out like, you know, is this a thing or not? So I think they thought that she was just with her non-Scientologist family in Ohio and there was nothing to report. I very much think that they didn't actually report her missing for months. Hmm. Like they probably just like, okay, she's gone. Like 
one less thing to worry about where we have an extra bed. Let's put another old person in it. Yeah. So, and, and let's be honest, nobody likes reporting that somebody escaped. That's not something <laughs> that's not that's not a good day when you're having to make that report. It's, it's definitely not a good day. And this is why I say that. So all of the pay in this probably was instigated in large part from the legal case, uh, Claire, that you and Mark brought forward that had specifically to do with all of the pay that you were deprived of over all of those years. Yep. After that case um, concluded, they stopped doing hard copy pay. And I think pay became a mandatory thing. And it was now there, it's now being direct deposited directly into Sea Org members' accounts. So everyone has an online account and it goes directly into their bank. And I and it like and I asked her, I'm like, well, you were at AO. Were you getting paid the whole time? She's like, yeah, we are. We were never not paid. So I have a feeling regardless of gross income for the organization, they realize like, hey, like we're going to keep getting sued if we keep doing this. So we need to pay our people. So they right. probably would round up the money to do that as a priority. That's this is my assumption. But yeah. And, and in the electronic to that, they changed the paperwork so that any CIRG member uh, signed a document saying that they're a volunteer and that they're receiving a dividend. So, yeah. But yeah, that yeah. was both of those items, by my understanding, were directly, like you said, a, an offshoot from the lawsuit that that we that we brought in regards to labor law violations and mm -hmm. all that. And even though we failed in court, this to me, you know. Well, again, that's how things change. Right. You the fact that I'm so this is what's going to happen after, you know, big SP Mike Brown is up here talking about all of the things that I have documented specific evidence of. It's not like I woke up one day and it's like, man, I'm really busy with this whole life I got. Let me make up a bunch of random shit about Scientology. Everything that I'm saying is very, very accurate. I, I don't need to embellish any of it. That's right. What is going to happen is they're going to clear out all of these places. They're going to figure out like it's going to be the big flap. What do we do with the old people? Not only in PAC, mm -hmm. but it at flag everywhere where they have elderly people, which is a lot of them, they're going to have to figure out what to do. There's been all this stuff with Bob Ferris, like save Ferris. We got to get him out of here. Like that's just another example of this. And I guarantee mm -hmm. these, these are, th these are not, this is not the only instance of the elder abuse. And now it's going to be a hot topic for Scientology to fix. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> anyway. So she has, um, very, very good legal representation. And uh, she wanted to do two things. So the reason why we think that she wasn't reported as missing originally is because they kept her pay going. Mm. So every, and this went on until July. So we were trying to figure out what's going on, but every, um, every week she'd get 50 bucks and it would just pop into her account. And it's like, it's as though she never left. So that's what it made us think like, are these MLOs like, oh man, we're going to get fried if we report this. Let's just kind of pretend that she's gone. I don't know if they reported her as deceased or what happened. Anyway, the, her pay kept going. Either that or they are so backlogged on being able to figure out who is working for their organization and their treasuries jacked up that they just kept her pay going, which I, I don't think that that would be the case if they actually knew that she had left. Right. So, um, so going back to the two things that she wanted to do, we, the foundation had, has been there for us the entire time in order to help with the care facility that she needed to be into. But we had also found like, Hey, she, she had all this money taken from her that she should have access to in order to pay for her care. Like this is the money that was taken from her that should be the, the resource to pay for these things. So we wanted to figure out how to pursue this because like that's her money. Like right. not only, not only it's not like she's asking for a refund as a public Scientologist. She was a CIRC member. Like right. this is straight up criminal, like embezzlement. So, so that was a thing. And then also it was very important for her to, as we're going through and figuring out all of this different abuse to be able to, in her own way, speak out against the people that, were her abusers and also call for change. She is a very loving, kind person and wanted to try to, now that she's identified everything that was happening to her, it was very important for her to be able to call, to identify those things and to respond to the organization in her own, in her own way in order to formally resign from the organization. 
Mm-hmm. So she she wrote a letter and, um, you know, it was checked by the legal team and the letter was addressed to um, David Miscavige and Tom Cruise. And the and that's not to make this sensational, but the reason why was because Miscavige controls everything on the inside. And then Tom Cruise is constantly one of their biggest supporters and people that are trying to promote Scientology you know, given the big IS Freedom Medal winner of Valor, whatever the new hotness is, that he's the best Scientologist ever above all Sea members. So we really thought that if there were two people that could actually change the things that are going wrong in this organization, it would be Tom Cruise and it would be David Miscavige. Mm-hmm. So this letter was composed and addressed to them. Um, and it was sent to Tom Cruise's agent because I don't know how to write to Tom Cruise. Uh, it was then sent to David Miscavige at his address in Clearwater, at his address at Gilman Hot Springs, at his address in Los Angeles. It was sent to the reports officer, RTC, to the uh, executive director international, if that person still exists, and to the uh, watchdog committee chairman, if that person still exists. <clears throat> and it was then sent, and it details, and it is written specifically to these gentlemen but it's also for her calling for specific change within Scientology. In this, she didn't even get into her financial uh, abuse. She was just getting into like the abuse that is is endured by many Sea Org members on a daily basis because we thought that that was the most poignant in terms of uh, the specific abuse that would be most relevant to the most people. Right. I want to make a point here, Mike. I'm Mm going to bring this letter up and show it on screen. Obviously, you're not going to be able to read it, it will be on my blog uh, where you, the whole letter will be there. But this letter is, oh, that's page four. Let me go. This letter is about the treatment of other people. Mm-hmm. This, is, this is what's so remarkable about Rosemary is that she is writing saying, Look, I was there for 35 years or whatever, and you know, there's a lot of things that are ongoing that are abusive. And she says, I address this letter to you, Mr. Miscavige and Mr. Cruz, like incredibly polite, because it is only the two of you who can effectuate the needed change within the church. My choice is to address this letter to you, Mr. C.O.B. Miscavige, is obvious. You are the undisputed leader of the church and the only living person in this world able to honor my requests. She is asking for change to happen. You can see, help me effectuate change, please. Please help me effectuate change. Please help me effectuate change. Please help me effectuate change. And all of the things that she is writing about are the things that happen to people in the C organization and in Scientology. She is not demanding, pay me money, do this, do that for me. She is saying, change all this for the people who are, I've left behind because Correct. they are the ones who are suffering now the things that I suffered, and that's not right. That's exactly right. So the copies that were sent out, we never got the one back from Tom Cruise, nor do we hear anything back from him. I know it's kind of a long shot. Like, I'm sure he gets a lot of mail. Um, the ones that were addressed specifically to David Miscavige were returned to sender. Like, they, they because we sent it all like certified mail, like it, it was, you know, several pages. So I'm like, okay, let's make sure these, these things arrive and get to this destination. So it was like, uh, This guy is so far away from being available to receive correspondence because he's probably scared constantly of all the legal ramifications and people like, oh, I'm being sued. So we couldn't even get it to him. But we never got back the copies that went to the reports officer RTC, to WDC chairman, and to the executive director international. The copies didn't physically come back, nor did we get any sort of response. And in that in that email, or sorry, in the letter, she provided an email address like, hey. Like, you don't even have to, like, if it's if it's a problem, you can email me at this, like, email address and, like, we can talk. So yeah. this was her first effort 
you know, aside from all the, you know, smoke and mirrors crap that goes on with the international justice chief, this is her talking to the people that can actually change in the organization saying, hey, I don't want to be part of this organization anymore, but these are the things that I would like to see that actually get improved. This is her, the first thing she did, it wasn't to create a legal stink. It was to write to them and say, these are the things that I am dissatisfied with. And they would not even answer her like nothing. She got no answer at all. Most of the, but the copies that did make it through, I'm sure that somebody was like, oh shit, she's not dead. Like we yeah. thought she was like in a care facility and now it's like, oh my gosh. So um, that was probably her first thing. And in there, she says, I am like, I am not a Scientologist. I do not believe in this. And she also specifically requests please do not fair game me. Please leave me alone and let me live my life in peace. And that was, that was a very strong point that she went through on that because she's like, look, I've been through a lot. Just leave me alone. Yeah. Let me, let me go about my merry way and all this. And she couldn't even get an answer to that. Um, and, and you can see there's no one we're sharing this now publicly because we got no answer. Like we, we got no, no feedback at all. We tried to communicate with the organization. The organization didn't communicate back. They didn't even so much as call us or send an email that say, Hey, you need to talk to somebody else about this, that you can't be writing to the leader telling him that he's doing illegal shit. You got to like talk to like somebody who can't actually change something. They didn't say anything about that. Right. So yeah. the, the next thing was like, okay, well, and it was, if again, we wanted to be respectful of the support that we were getting for the money that was um, being provided from the foundation or in order to, and, and it wasn't being provided to Rosemary. The foundation was covering, like directly paying for her to be able to live where she was. And it was like, okay, we know there's money that has been taken from you. How are we going to somehow get this back? We, she tried to open a dialogue with them. She could not do so. So uh, talking to the legal team, um, they then reached out to um, Graham Barry, who is in Los Angeles and has a lot of experience with dealing specifically with Scientology, also also directly related to recovering funds for people that have had their money extorted from them or people that are in similar situation to um, to Rosemary. And they drafted up a demand letter that said, hey, this is like just laying out her whole um, all of the, the statement of facts of everything that had happened to her. And we provided like, Hey, here's copies of her financials. This is the itemized list of all of the different money that was taken from her very specifically with all of our demands. And we said we would, you know, the first thing in a legal matter is like, Hey, this is our complaint. Are you going to honor any of this in order to make it better? And you, and she had a, <clears throat> she had a representation and that representation came in the most legal and ethical way possible. And it was directly to their lawyers in order to be like, hey, we're trying to open a dialogue about this. We couldn't do it by correspondence. L let's try it through the legal means. And there was a the deadline that was given to them on that, like, hey, this is what we're asking for. We're trying to get this back within this amount of time. If we don't hear anything back, it's going to escalate to the next level. OK, I'm going to I'm going to put that letter up now, Mike. Um, oh, here we go. Start at page 31. Great. <laughs> this is so a this long is, letter and this is a entire, long letter and yeah and this is the, um the entire ahead, thing sorry. again will be on my blog as soon as we're done with this live i'll make my blog live with this episode on it and these documents uh, but as mike said you can see this is sent to the president of Church of Scientology International, Jeannie Reynolds, a, an in-house lawyer who's the registered agent, the president of the Church of Scientology of LA, the president of Western US, Jeannie Reynolds, the commanding officer, blah, 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 Gary Soda, the sort of in-house counsel, uh, the table of contents. This is a long, long, long letter going through 36 pages of detailed here is exactly what happened. It happened this at this time. This is what happened next. These are the people involved. This was what they did. Here is the instructions for the chase wave. Here is how you go about. This is what they told. But like it is, it is detailed. So that letter is going to be on my blog too. So 
again, the normal thing that people do is if they need to get legal representation, they then send a demand letter. This isn't a lawsuit yet. This is just like, hey, we're trying to resolve this like at, at the lowest level possible to do the right thing. Did Scientology make any effort to respond to this? No, they did not respond to the legal team. Um, Brad and Brittany's uh, firm didn't hear anything. Graham Barry didn't hear anything back. The day before our demand of exactly when we needed to hear response from them or it would escalate happened, um, mom called me and she's like, Mike, I'm like, what? She's like, I, I, I just looked in my account there's a bunch of money in it. And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, somebody put $163,000 into my account. And I was like, wait, what? That's good news, but it's also very underhanded the way Scientology did this. The, the proper way for this thing to happen because these attorneys, they usually, they will work on what's called contingency. So you go there and you say, hey, this is, this is what I'm trying to get help with. They then do a bunch of work for you without being paid by you yet. Uh, contingent upon recovery of um, damages, and then they get then a portion of the money that is recovered. That's the way most of these personal injury uh, type of cases go. Um, it makes sense. Most of the people are underprivileged or have been taken advantage of and don't have the legal resources in order to do this uh, just to have a, an attorney on retainer because they have tax-free status you know, and have all the money that they could possibly want from all the wonderful IIS donations that everyone give. So, so by the money being sent directly to her, what they're trying to do is they're trying to basically cut the lawyers out um, so that the money wasn't recovered by the lawyers and then it would just be given back to us. And then hopefully we don't pay the attorneys. Right. That's so the first thing I did is I got on the phone with the attorneys and I'm like, hey, guess what? Um, as good as that information is, there's something extremely creepy about this too. She had already sent them a letter saying, I resign from your organization. I am not working for you anymore. In order to initiate a wire transfer of that much money, like this isn't just some like, hey, I'm going to sell you some money on your phone for like, you know, no, this isn't that. To initiate a wire transfer of that amount of money, you have to have all of the person's financial information. You have to have their address, their phone number, their full name, all of their bank routing information and it has to be exact. And if it's not typed exactly right, that wire transfer won't go through. Right. So, and th it just showed up and in there it said, you know, payment of funds to uh, Rosemary. And so it's good that we got that money back, but at the same time, what a violation of privacy. She doesn't work for that organization anymore. Can you imagine if you worked for some company and it was like, I don't work there anymore. And all of a sudden they're digging around in your financials. Like the attorney reached out and the attorney is not the one who got the money back. So now we're like, okay, well, what are we going to do with this? So we contact the legal team. We're figuring out what exactly to do. Um, and then we get a letter in the mail. Um, I don't have a an actual copy of it to put up, but I'm going to read you this email or this, uh, this letter, because I think it is, this, uh, is so interesting. Um, let's see if this is it. No. Uh, on what actually was, uh, found out about. So we get, um, this, this letter and it's addressed to, um, Rosemary from a lady named Carrie Evans, uh, who is, I guess the, here, I'm just pulling it up here. It's on my phone. Sorry. Apologies. Um, from to Rosemary Chickwalk with her address on it. Dear Rosemary, as you are aware, if you have any dispute with the church, your sole recourse is through Scientology, ecclesiastical ethics, ethics and justice procedures in accordance with the many agreements you signed. The church has no duty or obligation to return any donations. However, Donations you made between 2011 and 2017 have been recredited to your bank account ending in, and I'm not going to say the numbers. This recredit was made at the discretion of the church. We determined these amounts should be returned to you due to your unique circumstances as you were a Sea Org member at the time. I wish you well. Sincerely yours, Katie Evans, Chaplain. Is that not the most touching, heartwarming <laughs> letter that a person could possibly receive oh from their gosh. former church that embezzled a bunch of money from them. 
Unbelievable. Uh, the, 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 quest, the real question is, Mike, how many other people have they returned the funds to uh, that haven't got legal representation? Look, this <clears throat> is this is uh, pretty unprecedented. Mm -hmm. You you back in my days in OSA, money didn't get given back to people without them signing a release and releasing you from all future liability. We'll give you your money back, but you're going to release us so that you can't come to us. Effectively, this money, in my view, uh, the way that they just dump the entire amount without arguing about any of it or saying, oh, well, you didn't. Usually it's you didn't this. We can't find records of this and we can't find records of that. So we'll give you what we have the records for, if anything. And mm -hmm. they just took everything and put it all into her account the day before the, you know, nuclear option was yeah. about to go into effect in order to prevent that from going into effect. From my perspective, this is a, a, a tremendous admission of guilt. Like Completely. they know oh, yeah. that everything that they did was really bad. And yeah. they sent that creepy little letter from a nobody so that there isn't anybody important to be named in a lawsuit like whoever that person is probably didn't even know that that letter got sent out. Yeah. Um, and not, not to mention, they know that Rosemary has the names of many other elderly, uh, elder people that they have similarly abused and ripped off. And if a lawsuit goes into discovery phase, they are in very, very hot water. Right. Very hot water. So I, I'm not going to put Mike or Rosemary on the spot other than yeah. to say, because they know everybody is going to be saying, oh, well, you need to file a lawsuit right now and let's have a class action lawsuit and let's this and let's that. Look, the options available to them are being reviewed by the best legal minds that I know. And um, every factor is being taken into account, including that litigation, and I don't care how good your case is, Litigation against Scientology is ugly, messy, dirty, shitty business. And, you know, how much do you want a 77 or 78? How old is Rosemary now? 77? She's 77, yeah. Yeah. How much do you want a 77-year-old woman who's not really in good health being subjected to what happens in the course of litigation? So all of that, we can't speculate about or or really discuss and i don't want to put mike on the spot so i'm kind of saying it um but look we'll, we'll just say that it's pre-decisional at this point pre-decisional there you go yeah, you've got some go. great terms that you come up with that some of yeah. that some military... of some of the guys at work are going to be <laughs> laughing very heavily that i just use the term pre-decisional anyway. <laughs> i'm pre sure I'm, I'm, gonna, saying... I'm gonna use that from now on that's amazing mark I'm will be like you... what's the deal with x <laughs> Pre-decisional, honey. <laughs> Pre-decisional. <laughs> Pre-decisional. <laughs> you military guys have some amazing expressions. In any event, look, the the truth of the matter is that I said that this had a happy ending because the happy ending is that Rosemary is now out and she is reconnected with her family and she is living uh, the twilight years of her life in circumstances which she deserves, which all of these elderly people in the Sea Org deserve. They deserve yes. to be with their fucking families, not Absolutely. hold away in a in a room somewhere or some shady, you know, care facility. Uh, and in fact, I'm also putting on my blog a list of the names that Rosemary has of the people and the locations that they are in in los angeles which and, which and again of most of that joint... is exactly and this is information as she knew it um around the time frame of when she was in los angeles so there's a little bit of um time that's lapsed so that's very right. possible that while we've identified the people where they exactly are that if people have updates on that 
they should be providing those so that family members know where their loved ones potentially are and then can be there and available for them. Right. Yes, definitely. And and so we sort of reached the the end of this story to some degree, though obviously there is still ongoing things to happen and the uh, work of the Aftermath Foundation is not done, but we are no longer having to cover or the Aftermath Foundation is no longer having to cover those expenses because now that money is back just as Mike and Rosemary, and we had talked to them about this from the beginning saying, look, you have a good shot if you get good legal representation of getting your know, at least getting the money back and yeah. we're not going to have to support you forever and so that's worked out just as we hoped it would work out um i think that and, if people sorry go ahead and it and and it can also work out for others so and we've kind of we've talked about it on here and i also when i talked to Aaron yesterday the thing that Scientology is most terrified of is their financial crimes, because that's the thing that is going to have the biggest effect towards removal of their tax exempt status is the things that have been detailed here. This is this is not in compliance with their tax agreements for them to be a nonprofit. Like, no. I know I'm I am not a tax attorney and I have no clue what I'm talking about, but I'm going to go out a limb, I'll go out on a limb and say that that's probably true. So yeah, if I would there say are other so. people in this situation, <laughs> the, the attorneys that I have mentioned, uh, specifically because there's such a large population uh, population out in LA, Granberry is representing a lot of people specifically with claims like this. And yeah. they're not all going to be public like because they don't all have some, you know, big mouth son that says, you know, screw it, I'm going to go on and actually just like blow this out of the water. But you stand a, a better than excellent chance of being able to recover your funds because they're so terrified of their bad, their bad acts that they've actually, you know, starting to be called out on. So have at right. it. Yes. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, we will take a few questions. Uh, yeah. I, I know it's an hour and 20 minutes in, but nobody's leaving. The, <laughs> the number of people who are with us yeah. just keeps growing. So wow, yes. And to all the almost 2,800 people here, don't forget to head on over to Mike Brown's channel at Mike Brown 101. Um, and we were trying to get it to stream on there as well today, but either way. So I just started doing this and, you know, originally when I had decided to come on and speak with you and speak with Aaron, I was just going to be like the SP TV, you know, contributor guy that just kind of flies in and out and I don't really have my own thing. But if you're on YouTube, you already have a channel. It already kind of exists. So I'm like, well, I might as well just, you know, I guess put my photo on here and, you know, like fill out two little lines of things. And then um, my first uh, person that subscribed was Emily, my wife. And um, and then I was like, oh, I have like two more. It was, like, you know, like Mike and Claire. I'm like, oh, this is really exciting. <laughs> so in the last 36 hours, I'm over 2000 people have decided that they are interested in this story and they want to follow it. Um, Amazing. I'm going to continue. I'm going to continue to provide not only uh, specifics on this, because again, we've covered a lot of information that there's a lot of details about that we were not able to talk about. And I'm sure there's other people on YouTube that'll be like, Hey, would you mind sharing this? And I absolutely am willing to do so. So as I do that, I might as well at least have what I want is a repository of the information that I've provided because there's so many content creators that the content, unless it's the thing that you're watching right now, it's like, oh, where was that thing? The thing yeah. is going to be on my channel that's about this. And it's that's just going to be the information there. I have some other things that I'll share about my time at the Ant Ranch as a cadet. Uh, we'll get into details about that. And at least my truth will be in a place that I can have it as a repository for people to reference so that they can at least see, oh, hey, there was that guy talking about this thing. Well, that thing is at least going to be on my channel from the things that I can provide. So right. that's why I want to do it. Absolutely. Wonderful. No, it's awesome. Okay. So let's let's take a few questions and some super chats here. Mike Brown, Mike Rinder, Claire Headley, you all are amazing for uncovering all of this. Thank you for speaking out, speaking up and educating the world. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. I have to figure out how to do this. Christy, where are you? Uh -huh. 
Laura Strada, do the elite's parents get better care? Hello? Um, yes, in some, in some respects, yes. One of the big things about being at the int base with kids was that the children were kept at a property that was like 10 miles away or seven miles. I don't know how far away it was. Uh, this this yeah, infamous it was about a 15 minute drive or so. Yeah. yeah. Happy yeah. Valley. Uh, mm -hmm. the, you know, it wasn't very happy. Definitely but not. One of the <laughs> one of the problems for parents was if you didn't have your own vehicle, it was very difficult to get there because there would be a bus. But if you missed the bus or the bus wasn't the right time or whatever, you had no way of even getting there. And for the mm -hmm. most part, like I had a car as a part of being in OSA or the head of OSA. So I always had a vehicle. Ronnie had a, had a car. Ronnie and Biddy had a car. So we had much easier. It was much easier for us in many respects. And we had people that we could just stick in our car and say, go pick up Benjamin, Taryn, Justin, Sterling, Jenna, and bring them back. And mm -hmm. we wouldn't have to go anywhere or make that trip. So yes, to some extent that was the case. But um, most of the time that would be for like, Hey, I'm going to see you for a couple hours on Sunday morning. So oh, that the was way it. that it felt and that was it. So it was almost like the only interaction you got with your parents was this little honeymoon phase if you were lucky. But you also yep. knew as a child that if you like if you had like a complaint, you would get in trouble if you brought it up to your parent. Because it, anyway, there's a lot to go over there, but it uh, there's a lot of meat on that bone that needs probably to chewed on. And I have my own stuff that that's probably a whole nother video that I need to do. I yep, think it absolutely. is. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I, I have the same. My my experience was was in the Cadet Arg in England, but very very yeah. similar. Very very similar. Sorry, yeah. go ahead, Mike. Mm. Okay, Lauren Taylor, well done, team. I cannot imagine all of the OSA sweaty upper lips after seeing the names of all the helpers. Yeah, well, I hope there's yes. a lot of sweaty upper lips happening right now. Yes. Yummy. Okay, just a couple of shout outs. Uh, Kelly Copter was here. Kay. Amy Scobie was here. I Amy. saw Mark Fisher was here. Nice. Like a whole bunch of our buds were hanging with us this evening. Nice. Uh, and Goldie, of course. Oh, the one Goldie, and only Goldie. Course. Goldie is always here. I, I don't know. know what she does. That, that, this is her life. <laughs> she is everywhere, <laughs> all at once. Uh, Salty Common. Oh, how I wish there was an org in my area. The fun I could have trolling them. So a comment on that, and I and I get the humor in that, and 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 I uh, completely agree. Um, but in all seriousness, dealing with and helping people come out of Scientology, um, making them feel like the outside world is dangerous is actually is a is a major contributor to keeping them in there longer because they've yep. been indoctrinated that 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 is true. So the uh, the 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 best way to show them that there there's safety and compassion and uh, that the world is a safe place. Like this was one of the things that when I started talking to mom again, before we got her out of there, she asked me, she's like, Mike, are you on drugs? And I'm like, what the fuck? And I'm like, I'm like, I'm as a pilot in the army. Like I get your analysis constantly. And I'm like, I can't take an aspirin without having to go to the flight surgeon and say, can I take an aspirin? And they're like, mm, no, like, like we're there. So that's never been a part of my life. It's just like, I, you know, sometimes we're going, I'm like, man, it stinks here. And my wife's like, that's weed, man. You don't know what that smells like. I'm like, Oh, so, so for her to ask me that, I'm like, why do you think that? And she's like, well, I was told that the military, you know, PDH is all of their pilots. And I'm like, that is so crazy to me anyway, PDH just not true. So pain, pain, pain drug, drug hypnosis, hypnosis, that whole like MK ultra, you know, Mel yes. Gibson being like tied to a chair movie. And like, I'm like, they don't have time or money for that in the first place. And they'd never do that to their people. So it just yeah. doesn't yeah. make any sense. So there's these, there's these things that people in there think that are just not true. And right. the more we can make a safe place and dialogue for them to be able to decompress, which is very hard unless they have an opportunity to get away from it is, um, uh, is one of the best things we could do in order to help people leave. Yeah, yep. I would I would only add, I think that a key element um, that it's important to 
bring attention to in getting someone out of Scientology is an unfiltered communication per, uh, communication line channel to someone that they love and trust that doesn't judge them, that just lets them find their own way. Like it's not being monitored. It's not being filtered. It's just an open mm -hmm. line. And I think that when you were able to establish that, that very likely was a very important element in accelerating her ability to walk that back and be able to get out of there. Yep. Yep. Because she, she had to, she had to cross that bridge on her own. Like you can't drag somebody across that bridge. They need to, yep. they need to realize it or else they just think that all of the, the wog world's scary. Like, come right. on now. That's right. Yep. Anyway. Absolutely. Okay. Here's a great one. Maybe Rosemary could doodle something to be auctioned off by aftermath. Continue the rescuing Rosemary. We are so happy for you. Maybe you could ask her, Mike, if she would do that. We will do. We she will absolutely would. on our next aftermath fundraiser. And someone else had the same idea, and said, Elsie said, "Book of poetry and paintings, please." Wow, what a brilliant <laughs> idea! That yeah. that is a brilliant idea. Um, and uh, she just loves to do these things. Um, but yeah, that will we'll give that some thought. Um, after the documentary was made about Surge, um, which that story is remarkable and there's you know just so much that's captivating about it i i feel and i and i'm very close to this so of course i feel like i'm biased about it but i feel that my mom's story is also unique and needs to be told because of the fact that it can help so many other people yeah and i think these human interest stories like this are, are important so you know we've considered doing um a video about her um circumstances and specifically getting her out, which we've kind of encapsulated here. But I think that that would be a good documentary for us to chip away at. Uh, we'll have to just see, you know, I don't know if we couldn't do it with that Kelly copter because like oh, she set the bar pretty it's high. It's already in the works. It's already, already in the works. works. <laughs> right. Okay. We I have a ton of photos I've last, gotten from the. We took this up at our last Optimeth Foundation board meeting, which okay, was good. last weekend and it's rolling. Yep. We're rolling cool. because I have a we got a bunch of photos because remember, all of her photos were taken away from her and destroyed. Yeah. So all of her uh, brothers and sisters have gotten all the photos they had of her together. And we've been able to piece some of those together. So I have some, you know, that um, of the things of her early life and uh, some of my baby photos and things of that nature. So we're going to I'll scan a lot of these things. And if they're relevant for that, we'll, we'll at least have some some still footage that we can use for that, too. Wow. Wonderful. That's beautiful. Yeah. Okay, stranger than fiction. We need a second FBI raid on Scientology. Abso-fucking-lutely. I agree. Completely. Hope living good. Question, Chase Wave, isn't that illegal? Yes, it very. Is. Um, if you, yeah, the, the statement um, of facts that Mike is going to put up on his blog uh, from the legal team that states all this, <clears throat> it goes into great detail about uh, chase, wa uh, chase wave. And it also talks about this thing called the Amex cycle, which was kind of the precursor to the chase wave. So all of these things are documented in that as well as the exact procedures that they were telling their registrars to use in order to do these things. So it's not, it's, it's more insidious than just like, Oh, some bad apples did some bad stuff and we got rid of them. This was part of the institutional problem that they had going on. Uh, right under the noses of all the executives where they're just demanding statistics go up constantly. Um, and what's so crazy about this, and just a little anecdote. So when we were talking to the um, law enforcement about this and uh, going over like these credit card applications, these applications are all in her name. Now, granted, she's paid off all of this debt. But if you think about it, the fact that the applications are in a person's name it doesn't implicate the registrar that fraudulently did it. It puts that person in a stance where they committed a legal crime. So the the so they're like, this is really strange because we have credit card fraud where a person is falsifying getting these lines of credit, which is immediately being maxed out immediately, which is another super bad a red flag for something. It's not like, oh, living expenses and I'm living outside of my means and I don't have enough money. No, it's like credit card all like paid and directly to the advanced organization los angeles it's like okay well that's pretty straightforward but with that the the legal liability falls on the person who it's in their name 
Um, but what's so strange is the registrars do this and they're also terrified to get their stats up. They're, they're embezzling all this money. They don't get any benefit directly themselves other than not being in trouble because their statistics are down for the week. Yeah. It's not like I'm getting in this money and I'm getting a cut of the money. That's not happening. Right. Uh, there were only very few instances where there was somebody that got her credit card information and was like buying things online for themselves and that they wouldn't tolerate that. Uh, they're like, oh, no, no, he can't do that. And that guy's, we're going to take him off post. He's being bad. But the registrars could do it for the organization, but they themselves don't get any benefit from it. So when law enforcement looks at this, they're like, wait, usually somebody fraudulently gets credit cards, steals money, and then somebody benefits directly from it. The only, the only benefit is going directly to the organization itself. And maybe for the very higher ups that actually live a more luxury, luxurious lifestyle, your everyday Sea Org member, like all of the people that are under 65, they live like shit too, just like the seniors do. Like right. everyone lives like that. It's not like they were treating their seniors any different. Just as the seniors weren't able to take care of themselves, there no, there's no allowances for that. Like they can't right. do their own laundry or they need medical help. It's like, oh, they're a drain on the organization. It's beyond comprehension, but that is, that's so strange. So when law enforcement looks at this, they're like, it doesn't meet the typical model of, credit card fraud and embezzlement of funds because it's this organization that's taking all the money. Right. Yeah. Oh, and didn't, uh, and we didn't touch on this either, but when, when Rosemary was in the assisted living facility, weren't they trying to get her back on post still actively? Um, so that was one thing we were scared about because she was starting to get better and better and they were paying for her to be there. Um, so at a certain point, she was still pretty bad when she realized like, I get it, get the hell out of here. And it took us a couple months to figure this stuff out. But the, the medical officers started saying like, Hey, if you're starting to do better, we can probably move you to another. They have like other homes that are like on Edgemont street and closer to the complex building that they just have like a, like dozens of these people stuffed into. And then they'll have them like do letter writing and filing and things of that nature. And like, they're just in there and not being well, they have to take care of each other, but they're closer to the complex. Uh, so she, if she got better to a certain point, they yeah. would have moved her to there. So she was right. like, I got to keep like, I got to keep like getting better, but not letting them know I got better. And then we were kind of <laughs> against the clock on her being moved. Yes, completely. You know, so it Insanity. was sanity. Anyway, so she was literally like, it felt like she felt like she was undercover, you know, and of course I'm all pumping up the jam about the plan. Like it's a military op, which it's not a military op. This is me as a private citizen, but that's how I think. And that's how I was planning these things. So she, she was super excited about it and like, ah, oh, you know, meanwhile, she's, she's like, let's go. So <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Deviant Outcast. It is streaming over at Mike Brown's channel. Well, awesome. there you go. Yeah, I Hooray. saw that. I saw that uh, somebody said a little bit ago that there's 308 people watching over there. Three. Yep. Sharon Keo. So everyone, this is what uh, donations were used for. Very heartwarming. Yes. Yes. Free Xenu Project of Farsec. Not just free Xenu project of Farsec. Mike Brown, you, mm. Claire, Mike Rinder, everyone in the Aftermath Foundation and the lawyers are all heroes. I'm so, so glad you got out, Rosemary. You are an amazing person. Enjoy your grandkids and son. Awesome. Sweet. Thank you. Law Nerd fan, how can they get Navy Federal accounts? Don't they need to have a military correct connection or did they use you? No, no, no. So a lot of these... Uh... Uh, federal credit agencies uh, like Navy Federal, um, even USA now and some of these, and they're not using USA, but they were using Navy Federal very, very heavily. Anyone can apply for a Navy Federal credit union account. So historically, some of these credit unions have, were started specifically for service members. And as they grew up past a certain point, they realized, okay, we can open this up to the general public. So right. Any of you could go and open up a line of credit at Navy Federal Credit Union if you qualified for it. They're just like going and getting a credit card from Chase or Discover or any of the other ones. They're open to the public. Yeah. Right. Okay. Cindy Siskowitz, I guess. Siskovich. Siskovich. There you go. Siskovich. She, said, wow. she even put it, there. put it in there. Yes. This has me cheering and crying at the same time. Please give to the Aftermath Foundation. Yes, awesome. I second Absolutely. that emotion. Yes, me too. 
Uh, XSCN, how many older people do you think are now or have been in the same kind of situation as Rosemary? So, and uh, it's getting quite a bigger. few. So, it is. So, this is two things that are happening. Um, like the internet isn't Scientology's best friend, probably for recruitment. I'm just going, you know, I'm going to make that assumption. So, <laughs> a lot of the 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 couple things I've seen, a lot of the people that are there are the people that are old timers that have been there since the early, early days or came came in back before stuff started getting really crazy. And they still very much believe in the principles of Scientology. Uh, those are the probably the most dedicated. And my mom would have been in uh, one of those people. But they're also rapidly aging very close to what would be a normal retirement age or already well past that. The then they don't have a lot of probably like the middle demographics. They don't have a lot of that, but then they have younger people that are around 18 years old because I don't think they're actually recruiting people under 18 anymore because of the legal struggles that they're running into with that. So you have either very young people or very old people, but in general, the second and third generation Sea Org members, they were kind of brought up in it. The attrition rate for us is extremely high. And there is a few examples of that. And I, I know that Mike's family has been weaponized against him, but that's unique to Mike. But I would say in general, most of us that were like just grew up in the Sea Org and we never made the decision for ourselves. We usually end up leaving as witnessed mm -hmm. by two of the people that are on this stream are in that exact boat. Like we're yeah. like, this is stupid. We're out. Um, so they uh, at a certain point. They are going to start this problem of the old people is going to keep getting worse. So to answer your question, the when um, mom was still there, I was like, OK, we had some time like we were still trying to like get doctor's appointments and figure out if she could travel. And we're like, hey, let's do some data collection. Can you start asking questions in terms of who is in these other facilities? Because it was like she was starting to tell me these stories of other people that had the same issues that she had. We were able to make a list of a little over three dozen people. And this was back in 2021, 22, when we were finishing up this list. And some of that's probably a little stale in terms of who's where, just because it was being collected by her. Um, but it's probably was fairly accurate at that time that are aged out to the point where they can't work anymore, but are just being kept in these like board and care facilities or in houses that are owned by the Sea Org that are uh, close to that complex building, but they're not keeping them on the premises anymore. There are still some that are being kept in the main building and those people are being worked like Rosemary was day in and day out until they can't anymore. And then they move them back a little more, but still work them every day as they're dying of cancer or they're just keeping them off the property so that EMS can get to them a little bit easier without it being a flap. Um, right. But that's just what she knew. So, you know, if you want to, she, di she didn't know anybody that might be at the Hollywood Guarantee Building, any of the other Sea Org installations. This is going to be specific for the Sea Organization. It's probably not going to be the same, I'm guessing, in your Class 5 orgs because the contracts for those are a little bit more... Um, set like it's a two and a half year contract or a five year contract. And even though people re up on that at a certain point, if they can't work, they'll probably just stop their contract. Right. Um, right. But I, but in the C organization, it is a major issue. Yeah. yeah. And that, and there, it is a big issue in Clearwater, like big issue. There are a lot of elderly C org members in Clearwater. In fact, for a while, the elderly C org members from the int base were being sent to Clearwater to yes. shuffle them out of the int base. You know, that's how Phil Stevens ended up at, at Flag mm -hmm. and various other people. And yeah. it's also a situation at the int base, and it is a situation in the UK and in Europe and in, in Sydney and anywhere where there is a Sea Org installation, this is a situation. And it is not limited to the people in Los Angeles. It's all over the world. Yep. And I, and I will say, since we did part one on Tuesday, the amount of people that have reached out saying that, yes, this, this, what we're discussing is a, a situation applicable to a member of the C organization, but the amount of parallels with public el older public Scientologists who have been drained of every single last dollar mm. that they had. And even I, I heard of a public that had been made to uh, also open na uh, Navy credit union loans Navy as well yeah. as a public yeah navy federal sorry 
Uh, oh, yes. So Navy Federal is fully aware of this, and yeah. they are they are in contact with the authorities as well. They've they've learned that they were being screwed and are starting yep. to do their own investigations. So perfect. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's, it's insanity. Okay. Yeah. That I, and I've heard the same thing, Claire. Yeah. I mean, old old Scientologists are useless Scientologists in the minds of Scientology. So. Right. They get shuffled off, uh, ignored. If they if they beg and enough, they send a volunteer minister maybe to go uh, give them an assist. That yeah. is what happens to old Scientologists. Yeah, or they've put them to work in lower organizations doing filing and things like that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's one. Please explain how Mike feels now about being a father and a son and a military man. Um, so the, I, I love my job in the military. Um, I'm definitely reaching the point where I'm eligible for a military retirement. And at some point I'm, you know, going to probably hang up doing this and then move into the civilian sector. The most rewarding thing that I've ever done in my life is to be a father. And it is, I think having my children, um, and they're not here for me, I'm here for them, but it has helped me heal a lot from my childhood for me to actually be able to understand what happened oh, in boy. our childhood and to put things in perspective. So when I became a father in this setting of being able to raise them the way I want to raise them, um, it's hard to put into words. There's a lot of reflection that happens and, um, I try not to make my baggage their baggage. Um, but sometimes that's hard, but I would say it's the best thing I've ever done as being a parent. Amen. Here, here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. KD, thank you all for helping Rosemary and bring the horrific mistreatment of the elderly to the public's attention. I am more, I hope more elderly can leave. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. Yes. Me too. Okay. Between oh, between re legal representation and the Aftermath Foundation, there there's probably no reason why if people like, and this is the biggest thing, once we can help them want to get out of there, I think there's a mechanism now in place where that could happen. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So. Yes. Okay. Just for anybody who wants to know, this is Mike Brown's channel. I got so, the moderator working for me. Thanks, Goldie. Exactly. <laughs> take, take good note and get over there and subscribe and like and do whatever you're supposed to do. I yes. still don't understand this stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, is there a website database for families looking for loved ones in Scientology? People could report where last seen maybe anonymous inside sightings. Huh. I don't think that there is. That's yeah, a really so, good idea. Somebody actually gave me some really good suggestions on this. I'm going to forward them to you, Mike, um, because it's a, it's a very good thought. A very good thought. I, you, I know Aaron Mike, had once. Mike Brown, Mike Rinda. Oh, Mike, Mike Rinder. Oh, big, big Sorry, Mike, both, little Mike. Both. Mike big and Mike. <laughs> old so, Mike. Um, no, that's old Mike yeah. and young Mike. Old, or old Mike and then older Mike. How about that? Um, uh. But I think I think Aaron had had somebody on or he had done a segment at one point. There was somebody that's creating a database. And I think it's focused mainly on uh, people who have Deaths. passed away in Scientology. Yes. yes. But I don't know if there maybe there's a mechanism to incorporate some of these other aspects into that as a demographic. Yep. Okay. That's we'll a, figure that's it out. It's a really good thought. Yeah. Th thank you for that. Um, we're going to look into this. Yep. Victoria Aitken, well done. So happy that Rosemary has been given the opportunity to reunite with her family. Yes, yeah, so are we. Okay. Ben Horse, question. Whose stat goes down as a result of Rosemary's payout? Ah, that's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> so because all of the money was taken systematically from all these different organizations that ended up at their gross income. And then all that then kind of filters upwards towards C organization reserves. But Mike, like when there's an OSA payout, does that just come from the IAS or how does that work? Like where's that? Um, no, I'm sure that that was extracted out of those organizations. I, I'm sure that the finance office had 30 days to run around and figure out how they were going to extract that money so that it did not have to come from Sea Org reserves. Because if it comes from Sea Org reserves, the stat goes down, or and that's Dave's doesn't stat, right? go up as much as it was supposed right. to go up that week. So, 
Hmm. I would imagine that there was a lot of scrambling and running around and maybe some um, begging and CSWs for, you know, we need to take this money that's been set aside for, you know, whatever and reallocate it to returning and the the when you're when you're up at this level and this decision was not made by nobody's in the bottom of the AOLA organization this decision was made at the very top level the yep. very top level they could not have paid that money without having it approved all the way to the top. Yep. I mm -hmm. guarantee you. Absolutely. So someone is in, you know, there are a lot of people who are already in trouble for the for this whole chase wave credit card, uh, people who had gotten busted, sent to Africa, you know, whatever. But when it comes time for money to have to now be paid out, someone got a lot of heat about that. Probably Warren yeah. McShane and somebody in OSA and for not having uh, had Rosemary under control or mm -hmm. Rosemary handled. Yep. Or and the reports Mike officer Brown handled Religious or, Technology Center for having received that letter and nobody ever responding. Rosemary's right. original letter. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, I think the, the, the shit one thing the I wanted to no question. Oh, I'm sure it did. So something I want to mention, because I think I just want to give a shout out to uh, the lawyers and the kind of people that are representing um, cases against Scientology. So remember when I said the money was sent directly back to us and what that does is it tries to cut um, the lawyers out to disincentivize them from representing people, because legally, if a person just wanted to pull a, a Marty Rathbun and roll out like the lawyer's going to be screwed. Right. Mm -hmm. So. So, um, of course, we we're like, hey, let's settle up and, you know, let's let's get the money to go where it needs to go. And then we just send it back to them. So um, Brad Edwards and Brittany Henderson said, let me let's make one thing very clear. We want Rosemary to have the absolute most resources available so that she can live as long as possible and be able to pay her own way. We are waiving all of our legal fees and what we are entitled to in uh, this recovery and we hope she has an amazing life and we are going to try to contribute to that. That is pretty unprecedented. Like lawyers get a bad rap because usually like they kind of try to go towards where the money is. Like their their portion and their percentage of what they are entitled to of that is not insignificant. They were literally like, you know what? We love your mom and we we made a connection with her and we'd like to waive our legal fees. That's pro bono work done by some of the very finest lawyers in the world. And um, I mean, how do you like, how do you say thank you to something like that? Yeah. Like amazing. talk about selfless. Meanwhile, Scientology is like, hey, is there anyone with dementia we could get our IS stats with? Like, but meanwhile, these lawyers are like, you know what? We're happy to do this for you just because it's the right thing to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They, they are amazing, amazing people. I deal with them on a lot. In fact, Brittany is on the board of Child USA with me now. So they, they, are, they are the finest type of people that you could ever come across. Yeah. Absolutely. Cody Mack, love this. Being a mama's boy my whole <laughs> life. When I saw this story, I shed some tears. You're a good man. Thank you for your service. We're all behind you 100%. Thank you, Cody. Completely. Laura Boatwright, thank you, Aftermath team. This is how you clear a planet. <laughs> Bravo. I love that color. Brilliant. <laughs> yes. Okay. Masha Bentley, question. Do you think they are collecting social security payments for members that may have passed? Um, so when a person passes, there's supposed to be a, a mechanism in place where a death certificate is provided to from the hospital to the Social Security Administration. Right. Um that said, uh, I wouldn't be surprised, but I don't have any information that they are actually doing that. We would all answer identically, Mike. Yeah, <laughs> it like, would wouldn't not put surprise me. Past them at this it point. Wouldn't, <laughs> I would. I wouldn't even act shocked if I found out that they were no. doing like. Well, well, let so, let me anyway. just say, if they got social security payments 
for someone who had passed and they were coming in, nobody they would, would keep it. alert anybody saying, please stop sending these. Absolutely. No doubt about that. <laughs> Okay, how can a person earning $50 a week get a credit card? They can't. But if you're in Scientology and you know how to falsify credit card applications and put down that the person has assets, they own a home when they really don't, that they've got money in the bank, that they've got this and that, you can get anything. And that's exactly mm -hmm. what this whole scam is about. These people who are called registrars or fundraisers in Scientology perfected the art of how you go about getting credit cards and being able to max them out. You don't start with a credit card with a $100,000 limit on it. You start with a credit card with a very low limit and start maxing that out. And then you make an application for something else. And then you, mm -hmm. anyway, we detail a lot of that or Mike did in the first episode of this, and there is a lot of that information is in this letter uh, that Graham Berry sent that will be on my blog, so you can read it there. Yep. Tom Pirate First Class. Bravo, Zulu Mike. What a great mission plan. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> thank you. Jeff Bixby, thank you, Jeff. We're, we're going to hustle through these. We've got 14 left. I don't know if we're going to make it, but we're Got to get going soon. Um, pick 61, XJW here. Impressed with how you are all pulling together to get your loved ones out. I hope Scientology are investigated and sued to extinction. Me yes. too. Gary Jackson Moorhead. Hey, Jackson. Incredible work, Mike. Son of the century goes to. We Stand Tall song is now being sung as we are... <laughs> 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 uh, I don't want that in my in my head. That's a horrible earworm song. Yeah. Uh, anyway, love all thanks, of you. Jackson. Love you, Rosemary. <laughs> Moon Age Daydream. Question, is this a scenario loser Sea Org members that LRH didn't actually consider and write policy on? Older Sea Org members, I think that's probably supposed to say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. there is no specific policy on this subject. I uh, there may be a uh, there may be one flag order. I don't know. I have to look and see if I can find something. Do you mean on on the care of elderly, like what yes. you should do with somebody when they're aging yes. out? Yeah, there is like there is not a mechanism in place for them to have like a retirement plan. Like people people probably watch these videos expecting like to look at things through the lens of their reality and what these people are working in there it is uh it's like working in probably north korea and leaving from there is a probably like defecting from north korea right um so yep absolutely ah uh, maria Yay. hello crimes against seniors are three times because they're a protected class this includes fraud 877-4R seniors to report abuse. Is that a phone number? It is. Yep. We've used that uh, Yeah, it's for an ab abuse hotline. So yep. uh, the legal team is working specific elder abuse complaints filed with the state. Like these are things that are definitely in, uh, in the works, but it's important for people to know this because if you suspect or if you're unable to contact a loved one or your parent, there are mechanisms in place uh, both at the state and federal level to be able to do something about this. So right. most of the time people don't think about, like we usually don't like to think about getting old and dying because it's a shitty thing to think about, but this has put it right square and center and for me. So I've had to understand a lot of realities that I never did before, but there's a lot of things in place to help people specifically if they need it. And uh, the state takes it very seriously. Right. And I actually put a post on my blog, um, maybe four weeks ago uh, about a new law in California that Yashar Ali had found. And I posted that and what you can do and a link to a complaint form about elderly abuse or missing elderly people. So you can look that up too. Uh, Laura Boatwright, do senior SOs qualify for social security without prior actual employment? Yes, they do. So the way the social security works is 
from my understanding, you will get a higher amount for Social Security based off of the amount that you've paid into Social Security. But there is a baseline amount that you will get as just a person who is eligible for Social Security. And it's almost like a welfare payment. So right. even if you like don't four hundred dollars a month, just so you know, it's like it, it's right. not enough to for anybody to even remotely live on. But you will still do it. So even if you didn't contribute, you know, and if you contributed at a higher level, your the idea is you would then be able to, you know, your contributions would somehow match your lifestyle when you're going towards retirement. Social Security, there's a lot of problems with that system and we don't need to hash them all here. But even if you didn't contribute meaningfully to it, when you're eligible for it, you can collect it. And they make sure that people sign up for it and collect it. They also right. make sure people sign up for all of the state health care benefits because they do not have a program in place to provide health care for their members. Right. Like there's right. no health care. There's not like a health care plan. They're not getting Blue Cross Blue Shield or TRICARE or something like that when you're in the Sea Org. You get sick. They take you to a county hospital and you fill out the paperwork like a homeless person in order to get your stuff covered. That is how right. the Sea Org members get medical care. Right. Yep. Julie Lefebvre. Question, since the elder Scientologists are on Medicaid, can these boarding homes who bill Medicaid get in trouble with the state? That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know if they're billing Medicaid or not. So I know when Rosemary was there, th there was a direct payment that was being made for this board and care facility that was coming directly from AOLA. Right. So they, and I don't know that these like I think this place had been inspected. They had a bunch of violations. Rosemary was telling me they're having to fix it. Like towards the end of when she was there, she was taking pictures of all of the meals they were feeding her. And it looks like dog food. It's pretty gross. Um, but these, I think that these are like the, when you have somebody that doesn't qualify for a full nursing home, which is, you know, they would be at a medical point where they need that full coverage. They have to figure out where to keep them. So they're putting them in this kind of stopgap location uh, where they're not, they're, they're being taken care of better than they would be if they were just roaming around the complex by themselves, like getting into mischief. But at the same time, it's not a super great, there's, there's nothing for them to do other than sit around and maybe watch TV. It's not, they're not being fed. Well, they're still not necessarily getting, um, all the medical treatment that they should get. Um, just because there's not enough people to provide that to them. Like right. there's maybe two old ladies that take care of all of these people. And they're old too. So anyway. Yeah. Right. Holly Everett, what does Rosemary like? Is there a way people can send puzzles, flowers, candy, and cards? I will have to figure that out, but that is, uh, that is very generous, but we'll have to figure something out that works for her, um, that she would like. She's, uh, as a Seerg member, you're used to a very minimalist existence. Um, so she has everything she very much needs in large part because the aftermath foundation has been there for her to the point of being able to recover her life back to where it is. But I do, uh, I do need to look into options for that. If people do want to contribute, um, to her, um, uh, being able get, to do that, I will just say get a PO box, get a PO yeah. box, Mike, no, and then you can just I, publish it. I have a or solution. It can go to Claire. I have a solution. <laughs> yeah. Anyone can send an Amazon gift card for Rosemary to the aftermath foundation and I will get it directly to there you, you Mike. Yeah, that's wonderful. I will say that um, from from mom's perspective, and I will echo it as well. If you want to contribute to this, because she very much feels strongly, and so do I, about this as a cause. If you want to contribute to the Aftermath Foundation, that is the direction we would like the funds to go to. So she, we have recovered funds. It's enough to cover her for a period of time. Um, and, but there's other people that could stand being helped. That's it, like, this is a good direction for your money to go. So if you did want to contribute to mom, contributing to the aftermath foundation is going to go to a cause that she directly and very personally supports. Wonderful. Amazing. Wonderful. And of okay. course, and of course, the Aftermath Foundation is not going anywhere. We're going to be around. We're going to, we're here to help people and, Yep, Osa, come on out or go back to your hole because your <laughs> efforts to harm the foundation are going to continue to fail. <laughs> yep, uh, free Xenu project of Farsec merch idea. Scientology abuses the elderly. 
Hmm, maybe we'll get one of those. Yep. Susan mm. Ward, so proud to be an Aftermath Foundation supporter. Thank you, Susan. Absolutely. Laurie Thank Driscoll, you, Susan. that's 1610K haircut. DM had to go <laughs> Good point, Laurie. Wow. Not wrong. Laura Estrada, question. So your mom had to suffer in pain after a life-saving surgery and recovery is basically work you harder and audit it, audit you more until you die. I'm so horrified. Yeah. Again, the auditing is they were only going to give it to her if they were able to make her pay for it. And right. I know we had stated this before. A Sea Org member is supposed to receive, like the idea is you join the Sea Org and you're going to make it up to be an OT and all of these things Scientology promises is like a, a condition of your employment because you're working selflessly for this organization. It right. doesn't happen. The entire time she was there, she was she was at the level of grade four, which for those watching who don't know what that is, that's that's before you go to the state of clear that she had uh, received as a public Scientologist 35 years before that. She hasn't, even though through all this auditing, she still never made it to clear. Right. Like $163,000 later, they they were they had no intention of ever letting her go clear. She had all these medical conditions. Claire, would she be in a legal PC? Like, would the, should they have even been yeah. auditing her? No, very like, definitely It doesn't not. even fit their model of who they should be auditing because of her medical condition. But they were right. like, We'll get, we'll get the money in. We'll spend the money. We'll make our stats go up. It's, it's like a hamster wheel. It's really weird. So yeah. anyway. Yep. Martha Simons, Mike's lawyers might actually be the most ethical people on the planet. <laughs> yep. These people are amazing. I mean, wow. And last one here. Denver Stevo. Yay. Mama's boys unite. So happy this story ended as it has. Mike. Thank you for sharing. Claire, I'm sending something your way for Mike and Rosemary. And O, oh, and Osa smells like poo. Nice. Thank you, Denver he, Stevo. He is, Good to see you. Here. Nothing Good if bit. not consistent. Yes, very <laughs> definitely. Even down to the uh, picture, the profile picture there, very definitely communicates yeah. that very well. Right. The angel wings set it off a lot. <laughs> okay. So that's the last question we're going to have. I am going to now show you a recent photo of Rosemary, and then we're gonna say goodbye, and I'm gonna leave on the screen a current photo of Rosemary and Mike together. Here is Rosemary. When did you take this, Mike? So this was uh, taken uh, a few months back. Uh, it was one of the actual caregivers in the facility that she's at. This is out on the front porch. The area where she's in is a, it's nicely wooded around there. She can go on little walks. Um, they even have no trespassing signs. So when the PIs come and try to infiltrate it, like the staff come and chase them away, local <laughs> law enforcement's like on our side already because Scientology started doing that. So I'm like, well, I guess I'll call the cops on myself. Um, so they're all true. But anyway, she's, she's there on the porch, uh, enjoying the afternoon sunshine and, uh, very happy. Amazing. That's amazing. And now we are all going to say goodbye. And like I said, I'm going to leave the end of this video, a photo of Mike and Rosemary together, a recent photo. Uh, I think it's very appropriate that that be how we, oh my hey, God. Mark. They let you <laughs> out. Good. They In let the you out. <laughs> you escaped. Uh... <laughs> lucky okay i'm, I'm not going to say anything else <laughs> it's all it's all good we love you rosemary we love you we Mike love Brown. You. thank you for your strength courage thank and you, bravery for watching. your mother it. it has been an honor to to work with you both and here's to many more Likewise. years yep absolutely thank thanks mike our, our love to your mama we will see you all again whenever the next video comes i don't know when that will be what I think that we will probably be back with Mike at some point talking about some of these other things that we haven't even gotten to. Yeah. But uh, remember, all of the documents that I referred to are over or will be over on my blog as soon as we're done with this. I uh, encourage everybody to go to Mike's new, uh, YouTube site, to Blown for Good, to mine, subscribe if you haven't subscribed, like everybody's shit, Le like, let's keep this momentum going because this is actually changing things. And I'm going to leave you now with this picture of Mike and Rosemary. Uh, again, thanks everybody for, 
for staying all the way for two hours and eight minutes. Oh, we're still on the bottom. I can't get rid of that. Okay, whatever. <laughs> oh, Bye. wait, wait. There is a way. There you go.